All right. So, despite my protests about the name of this this panel, uh, <laughs> we are exhuming the TTI Vanguard. Yeah, exhuming is board. not the word we're going to use today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was my preference not to do that, but uh, I, I only got one vote. Um, hey, Peter. The the point of uh, this morning's conversation really is to, to revisit the origins of Vanguard, the philosophy behind it, um, the the guiding principles, if you like, uh, over many years, and um, we want to, as this is the last meeting with with uh, many of the folks who've participated in the past, then we really want to make sure that that uh, the positive aspects of that philosophy, those philosophies, carry forward. And um, also maybe give you some clues about how to future-proof your own organizations in, in um, the coming years. Um, uh, the gentleman on the screen there is Peter Cochran. Uh, when Peter was on the Vanguard board, he was the chief technology officer at British Telecom. He then uh, has since gone on to uh, various other endeavors with startups and, and uh, in academia. Um, is Alan on the line also? Do no, uh, no, Alan okay. wrote us this morning. He's okay. in the hospital and not feeling well. Uh, very sorry to hear that. Alan Kay was scheduled <clears throat> to join us as well. Alan is also living in London at the moment. Um, from your right to left, Rich Schrote, who hopefully uh, you've all had the opportunity to meet during the course of the last day and a half. Uh, Rich was the uh, originator of the Vanguard program, the first person in charge of running it and defining uh, many of the things, many of the, the principles and philosophies we're going to talk about today. Uh, next to him is Eric Hazeltine, who likewise I'm sure is known to all of you um, for his illustrious career, both in private <clears throat> and public organizations, and the value that he brings to these meetings has always been exceptional. And then uh, nearest to me, of course, is Len Kleinrock, uh, our chairman for, uh, ever since TTI took over the program, and uh, I had the privilege of working directly for Len for many, many years uh, prior to uh, Vanguard. We'll learn a little bit more about all of that. Okay, uh, so the first few minutes we're gonna spend here is about the, the origins of Vanguard back at Computer Sciences Corporation and Index. Uh, Rich, why don't you tell us how the whole thing got started? Yeah, uh, so I'm going to just focus on the start of this because it's a, a, a relic and it's something that's important, I think. The uh, origination of this came during a time, I think the context is that it was a time in the 90s where we were exploding that computing and, and technology was starting to actually become something more than that was in the basement of places. And it was becoming a, both a business itself, but it was also becoming integrated into uh, the business as a new feature for things. And so it was a time where nobody really knew what was going on. I mean, the word internet was not in the vocabulary of any uh, a business person at all. And I remember uh, I was at Marriott Corporation. I was the chief technology officer and reporting to Bill Marriott. And he had asked me to come there because uh, the IT people couldn't talk to the businesses. And so I spent a number of years doing that. And Jim Champy <clears throat> and Mike Hammer, who wrote the book Reengineering the Corporation, saw what we were doing in technology. We were actually making money for the corporation versus spending money. Okay, and that was for Bill a, a great delight. We, we were using technology to do something completely different. And so as a CEO, uh, this was a huge deal. And so Jim and Mike came down because they were looking for an example in their books about an actual reengineering that was going on using technology. So this was a, a discovery period for business about what to think about technology. And they said, hey, would you like to leave? And I said, no, okay. And they said, well, we really do want you. We, we, here's the proposal. Um, we have, Alan Kay came to us. Now, Alan was working for Accenture at that time, and uh, it wasn't going well, doing the same kind of thing that he was doing at Vanguard. 
but Alan is a special character and needs special care and feeding, okay? And so uh, I said, I, I don't know what you want to do. He said, I want you to put together a board. You have to pay for it. Uh, a board that no one can afford to sit next to. I said, what, what does that mean? And he said, well, uh, we've got Alan Kay, and Alan is, came to me and said, this is how he'd like to do it, but I need somebody to interpret the business issues that all these technologists are going to bring, because no one's gonna understand how do I take this back and use it in my corporation. We're gonna have a bunch of technology guys giving technology, but so what? And I said, well, that, that sounds interesting. Uh, okay. So I resigned from Marriott. I went to Cambridge. Alan and I sat in a room together, first time we'd ever met. Uh, and uh, Mr. Champy said, okay, guys, why don't you start this business? I'm going to give you six months. I uh, want you to hire a board that no one can sit next to. And we have a sales team that's going to go out and sell this. Now this was with Index. Index at that time was like the high end, even higher than McKinsey Consulting. It was just, you know, made up of just amazing people. And so they also ran a whole series of multi-client programs. So this was not new to them to go out and pick an area like human resources or CEO meetings or et cetera, and they knew how to price it really high. So what we did was we had the sales team go out, we laid out what we wanted to do, which was to help communicate 12 to 18 months in advance, approximately what the next generation of this looked like. And so that seemed to be about the right timing. And Chunka Moy, Chunka was a new MIT student. He'd gone over to Index. He was too bright to be in the consultative side because communication and stuff was all messed up, and so they needed him over on the research side. And so Chunka and I, Chunka worked with me then, and we developed this. First meeting they sold, uh, the sales team, was to Yellow Freight. And I decided I was gonna die. Okay, um, here I am. I just left the chief technology officer reporting Bill Marriott at Marriott Corporation, and my first customer is Yellow Freight coming in to index. Okay, it, this is not the way I wanted to start my technology uh, adventure. But Yellow Freight turned out to be just an amazing organization. And the first meeting was in a room, uh, well, if you were to pull this cord and pull one in the middle, it was in a small room where Alan sat down in a chair, I sat down in a chair, Yellow Freight guy was in a chair, and we had a meeting. That was the first meeting. There was no group like this, right? It went so well that the Yellow Freight people could take back and do what we were talking about that all of a sudden they started spreading the word. And at the same time, Alan said, hey, I should have Nicholas Negroponte sitting here with us too. I'll go get Nicholas. Now, these guys weren't doing it free. Alan was six figures, okay? S sorry, Peter, in case you didn't get paid that much, okay? Uh, and it was multiple parts <laughs> of six figures, okay? And Nicholas was going to be six figures also. So we were paying big dollars at 1992, 93 or four, okay, to get this in, but the charge for the program was $50,000. Okay, to, to join a program that nobody had even heard of. And so when Nicholas sat down, uh, we had three or four more sponsors, same size room. We met again, very closed, and, and we did this thing. And all of a sudden we really realized, hey, we need some pre-readings. So reconnaissance started, okay? And we didn't re do it from magazines. We had the guys write pieces for us, original things. And all of a sudden, like, this is really cool. So we started to grow the program. It grew to 10, 15 people. And we started to find that all these guys that we brought in only had one thing to say. They just said it 10 different ways. And so that wasn't working for us, okay? Because people in the audience were complaining that, you know, you gotta get Alan off the stage, you know, or you gotta do this. So the microphone started. And that's why you all have microphones today, because we couldn't get the speakers to speak enough 
about what we really wanted to talk about and answer the questions that the people in the audience really had. So the package was you get a microphone and you get to come to the conference and then we did the speakers again and we found again this wasn't working even with the microphones. So we decided to create a coliseum where the people would be brought in and slaughtered, okay, in front of other people. And the other people would allow that to occur and they would accept that as part of the program. And you know what? That was the key. It was the key for truth. Uh, the best quote one of the sponsors ever told me was, I asked him, why do you come to Vanguard? He says, I come here because I don't have to read. I said, what do you mean you don't have to read? He said, this is the truth session. He says, you guys bring in front of us all the people I need to know about my business. And then we can grill them to the point where I get to the truth. So when I turn on television, I'm watching the same thing we just talked about last week. I thought, man, that is a principle that I'm going to really follow on this. And so the combativeness that you maybe feel in some of the meetings or the, the discontent, it was done on purpose in order to surface the truth. So Gordon Bell would sit in the, and he'd calculate after somebody said, this is how it's going to work, and Gordon would say, bullshit. It's not, you can't do that, OK? And all of a sudden, people started to realize Oh my God, I got to go on this stage. This is the gurus of US technology. This is scary. So we had a number of those kind of situations. But if you go back to principles, that was the fundamental principle. The microphones, because we wanted to engage the audience so they could take back what they needed. And the other thing uh, I did, which I'll tell you about and you, you shouldn't know, but I'll tell you all the little secrets today, uh, the evaluation forms. Okay, you're going to be filling them out. Chunk and I would take those back, and we would never turn them in to CSC. We rewrote the evaluation forms as to how we saw the program. Okay, because I didn't want anybody critiquing Alan Kay or people like Eric or anybody. These people earned their place. And to tell me that Alan or Bill Gates talk too much, or he wasn't as friendly as I thought he should be. You know, baloney. We, we wrote our own rules. And the real rule that we had was, did they renew? And so the program grew to 175 companies, paying a lot more than the original $50,000 to come. But it was the real key, I think, of Vanguard. So Lynn, that's the five minute story. Terrific. Uh it helps me understand what happened when TTI took over Vanguard and what we, <laughs> what we inherited. No, no. Absolutely. All of the all the hair right. and the energy and the challenges. So let me take you back a little bit. Um, you notice the name TTI Vanguard. There's a TTI and a Vanguard. TTI stands for Technology Transfer Institute. And if we can get the slides up. 1975. I wrote a book on queuing theory. You can't even spell that word, much less be interested in it. It was about theory. But the second, a year later, in 1976, I wrote a, another volume on computer applications. And guess what? That was all about the internet. And basically, as Rich said, the idea of the internet was just nobody understood what it was. And yet this book described how it worked, how we measured it, how we deployed it, the kind of challenges we had. So I decided this technology has to get out to the technology world. So my wife and I, Stella, decided to form this company called Technology Transfer Institute. And the name really meant something. We wanted to transfer the technology of the internet out to the technology world. So we created this in 76. This was the first brochure we had. That's the beginning of the organization to which you are sitting right now, 1976. And we decided just a simple goal to put on a conference, a three-day conference, three of them, across the country in 1976. It was going to be on computer networks, something people didn't even know about. First one was in Dallas. You had how many people in your room? Two people Two. in the room? Yeah. 
we had 14. So we couldn't afford to bring anybody out to Dallas. So I went out there with my suitcases full of notes and books and handouts, got there, opened up the registration table, registered everybody, closed the registration table, got up on the stage, introduced the speaker, and started to present. It was a big success. Then we went to Washington, we had 60 people. And in that particular one, we decided to bring my wife. We had 60 people, we couldn't afford it. So we decided not to have her name, Stella Kleinrock. So we just said Stella. Unfortunately, in the second volume, the book is dedicated to Stella. So the cover was blown, it was a great meeting. So having done that, we did this summer of 76, three successful conferences. In order to get the word out, we decided, say, this is a pretty good thing. So I just said, let's repeat this with other technology experts. We decided, let's put on some more seminars. And what was the qualification for someone to be a speaker at one of these things? They had to be the best technologist in the field, having written the best article or book, and was a great presenter. And sure enough, we put together in winter 77, six conferences. So it went from one to six. Big success. By the fall, we were doing 12 seminars. Next couple of years, we were doing 24 seminars. Now, understand, all this while, this was just an avocation for Stella and me. I was still a professor at UCLA. So we began to hire some people to help us with this. Uh, Tony was in, in that chain of people who was directing some of this technology. So it grew, and it grew, and then we took on, has anybody ever heard of James Martin? One, two people. He was one of the guru yep. conference speakers across the world at that time. So we put him on eight times a year, a couple of hundred in seminars. So this thing was beginning to grow. But 1980s, we had over 100 seminars. So there's a little company called Technology Transfer Institute. We hired people to take care. Tony was one of our CEOs along the way. By 1983, we became one of the Inc. 500 most rapidly growing companies, of course, all business. Now, here's some of the speakers we had. You may recognize some of these names. I think you'll recognize those near the top. These are some of the speakers we had in this organization. We went after the best people. Yep. We got Marvin Minsky, Vin Cerf, Alan Kay, Bob Lucky, on and on and on. And here's some more. Bob Kahn, Bob Metcalf, yep. head of IBM. On and on, it was, it was a great group. Meanwhile, as you heard, Vanguard forms in 1991. And they were doing great, and as you know, uh, Rich was among the people who started that organization. The early board members, you didn't see their pictures. I want to show you the pictures of these people. John Perry Barlow, bless him. Mm. He was the, somehow the, the stuff. When he got up there and he spoke, you listened. He was the only one with stickers on his computer, too. Okay, all kind of <laughs> Grateful Dead stickers. It, it, it caused the room a certain degree of concern, but yes. He, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll tell you stories about him later <laughs> in the story time. Uh, Gordon Bell with the bullshit argument. Yep. We'll tell you about that as well. Peter, who's here with us. Alan Kay. Alan, we hope you're doing well. Doug Leonard, great guy, Bob Lucky. Bob Lucky could yep. weave a story with a sly humor, unbelievable. Nicholas Negroponte, dominant, he knew the crowned heads of England and Europe. David Reed, Larry Smart, and on and on and on. This, this is a collection of people. Yeah. So basically, TTI met the Vanguard for. I knew most of them. And in July of 1997, we started talking. And they said, you know, we'd like to leave CSC and join another group like yours to carry forward the elements, the, the, uh, the, the stuff of Vanguard. So we decided to take them on. At that time, we had quite a number of conferences going on. And Vanguard at the time was running five a year. So we merged in 1998. That's where the name TTI Vanguard comes from. Now what went on at these meetings? It was, besides all of the interaction and the telling the truth and the interaction with the audience, we had demonstrations. We wanted the first people to show Roomba. It was running around the floor during the meeting, cleaning the rug in front of us. We had uh, McCready flying drones on our head long before the word drone was even invented. And here's an example of the kind of things we would 
show at our meetings. I mean, it was just an exciting time. We also talked about Boston Dynamics, what they were doing to robotics. You've all seen this kind of thing. Uh, this has to attract your uh, childhood dreams of playing with toys. And they weren't just technology of things, they were fun. So, that's the kind of thing you'd see going on at our meeting, besides the interaction, which we're gonna talk about, with the anecdotes in just a little while. But we had a number of meetings overseas. Uh, one of the first ones TTI and Vanguard did together was in Paris. And then we get to these other places. We were on a lot of buses going to meetings, Beijing, Berlin, Amsterdam, traveling a lot, Tokyo, Vienna, Madrid, John Perry Barlow, yeah. Bob, Bob Lucky, Lucky, and myself, man. working hard. Barcelona, Barcelona, there's Stella and Robin Lockett. She was basically handling all of the arrangements for our organization. Beautiful women, talented people, enjoying each other. Bob Lucky in the front, there's Mike Hawley next to him. There's Tony, you see on the right, second back. We were working hard. Uh, there's John again, wonderful guy, couldn't miss him. And we found the name of Vanguard all over Barcelona. I mean, we, they heralded us. And here we are again, uh, working hard in the seminars. And uh, we didn't uh, pause to enjoy ourselves. Whoops. Let's go back to that one. Can we play that, Brent? You can see it. So these meetings were serious. Here's some of the people who spoke at the TTI Vanguard group now. And you see again, names you should begin to recognize again. There's on and on and on. Uh, the quality of the people and the interaction and the microphones and the challenges uh, just went on and on and on. So in fact, we marched on in 2013. Euro Money basically took over. Now we're having Jana at Nemerides taking over. And the point is, this tradition continues right. over and over again with the same essence, the same energy, the same idea. We're going to engage, we're going to challenge you, but more importantly, you have to challenge the speakers. Don't let them get away with anything. Right. And we haven't had enough questioning at this meeting. I want you to really engage this afternoon. Whoever's going to speak, whoever's going to talk, take them apart. Yep. Along with Chris. That's the whole idea. So well, we wanted to spend um, a few minutes on some recollections, but uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure we're going to have a whole lot of time for that. Uh, Eric, though, uh, and let's give Peter and Eric an opportunity to uh, some of your favorite Vanguard moments. Well, I just wanted to make a 100,000 foot observation that you've heard about the what, and it's fabulous. And that's the analogy of the watering hole that brings the animals to drink <laughs> and nourish themselves. But they come for the water, but stay for the other animals. And to me, Vanguard, above all, has always been about the who. That for me, when I remember the greatest value I had, it was a hallway conversation. It was a dinner conversation. It was going on a walk or a run or something like that. Exactly. And I think that uh, social capital, to me, is more important than intellectual capital. And boy, does Vanguard have that. And you might wonder why we start the meeting by asking you to introduce yourself to someone around you and why we have so many breaks, and why we have these field trips, and why we have these activities, they aren't peripheral to the point. They are the point. Yep. And I think that going forward, that's a really important way to look at it. And as leaders, there's really no better way of developing your people than to send them to a place like this where they grow their social capital. Because that's really the key, and that's the essence of our book, by the way. You don't have to read it. We'll just summarize it right here. That Innovation is a social process. It is anthropology, it is not technology. That's great. And the anthropology happens here, where you get to know people. And when you look at the history of successful technology transfer, where you see failure, you see no relationships. Where you see success, every single time, you see relationships across the valley of death. And those relationships aren't formal. They're, I had a beer with them. 
I play softball with them. I go to church with them. We're both oppressed minorities in this company. At NSA, we had the oppressed minorities of the math mafia and the linguist mafia, and it was fabulous. Because they were oppressed minorities, they bonded together across organizational boundaries. And so I think that, uh, to me, that's the magic of Vanguard. It's all about the who and less about the what, although the what is pretty good and keep paying for it. <laughs> Before you put Peter on, there's a story about Peter, I have, to, I have to tell you. One of the problems we were having initially in Vanguard is we had no Europeans in, in, on the program. And we could not find anybody over in Europe at the equivalency of Alan and, and Len and, and the names that you saw here. And we searched and searched and searched and searched and could not find that person. Peter is that person and still is the only person as far as we're concerned who leads those types of things. So that's the introduction that I'd like to give to Peter. He was our cherished European individual as part of this. Well, I just have to say before you do that, my wife is French and she's sitting here thinking, English isn't European. <laughs> and there is no such thing as the English Channel. It's called La Manche. There, there you go. Okay, fair enough. So with that, Peter, go ahead. <laughs> now try. Okay. Well, thanks for that introduction. Let me give you a little background. Um, I was made uh, Chief Technology Officer of British Telecom. Uh, you have to imagine what you have to do to change a giant uh, corporation. And the answer is be outrageous. And uh, I inherited a program. Uh, which was one with Nicholas uh, Necroponte and MIT Media Lab. And I went to have a look what uh, they were doing, and I, I made a decision that we were, we were not pushing enough, we weren't getting enough value for money. And uh, I uh, organized an office for, for me and my people at MIT, and uh, I encouraged Nicholas to send his people over to my laboratory. And uh, I had an edict, and it was simply demo or die. I'm not interested in PowerPoint. I'm not interested in reports. We've got to shake this organization to get it into the 21st century, and we need to have some live demos. So the upshot of this was uh, a gentleman called Steve Mann, who was heading up <laughs> the wearables team. I got Steve uh, over to the lab. He looked like a walking computer. And we, I went out with them, and people would cross over the other side of the road rather than uh, confront us. Uh, <laughs> but Steve was pioneering, along with his group, uh, what you might now call Google Glass or the, uh, uh, the Apple product. And they were doing it scientifically, and they were making very... And I uh, was then invited into uh, TTI, and I was asked to find some speakers and uh, I, I thought immediately of Kevin Warwick out of the UK who did uh, uh, the uh, robots, the miniature robots and swarming, and he came over and did a demonstration. And um, I realized that was not enough, so uh, I, I went to see Steve Mann, and I said to him, I want you to come to TTI, this is what it's about, and I want you to be really outrageous. I want you to do something that blows the mind of everybody in the audience. And I left him to it. So uh, we came to the meeting, it was pretty much like uh, this one. And as I walked in, and I always used to sit uh, on the right-hand side of the front, uh, where uh, Rich is sitting right now. And uh, to my puzzlement, there was a child's swimming pool on the stage. And uh, look, this is a bit weird, I don't know. And we started off, uh, Steve walked onto the stage, uh, looking like a walking computer, he'd got uh, a huge amount of equipment on his head and antennas sticking out. And he started to demonstrate his kit. And then all of a sudden, he, uh, he kicked off his shoes, um, dropped his pants to the floor, took off his jacket, undid his tie, pulled off his uh, shirt and revealed a body covered in technology, at which point he, he was still talking and presenting what his technology could do. He stepped over to the pool, lay down in the pool with just his head above the water and announced, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, it is also waterproof. And that was the finale of his presentation. <laughs> 
uh, <laughs> at which time uh, Tony uh, looked at, I think he, Tony looked at me and then looked at the audience and said, um, I think we'd better have a coffee break after that. So we had a, <laughs> a coffee break. So this was uh, in the spirit of the, the Vanguard and the TTI. And um, afterwards, I congratulated Steve. And um, my, my favorite memory of him was I, I told him a, a technological joke. Uh, it, um, I asked him the question, do you go to bed in that? And um, he says, yeah, I sleep in this. I said, my God, I can see the pub a published uh, headline in the, uh, in the Times one morning will, will be Steve Mann rolls over in bed and electrocutes wife. And um, <laughs> no, he didn't react. And then about a minute later, he started to roar with laughing. And I, 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 I put that down to the, uh, the latency of his technology. And possibly <laughs> not anyway, it was a, it's a great, great remembrance. And that was just one of very many of the type of demonstrations that we had. But I, I like to believe uh, that, that that one was the most outrageous. So oh, there were plenty. We had, we had plans for everybody to share some recollections, but uh, it was supposed to be about a minute each. That clearly is not going to be possible. Right. <laughs> um, what the, some of the value that we wanted to leave you with from this session, though, was um, how to future-proof your organization. You know, what, what are some of the lessons from Vanguard that will help you to you know, be relevant in future? So I actually jotted a few things down because as you get older, you have to jot a few things down, right? I think the number one thing that came to my mind, uh, listening to Peter's story, is the creation of an environment with cognitive diversity. It's not about race or anything else. It's about the brain. And you want characters. You, you want characters around you like Peter and, 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 and Steve and, and others like that constantly. I mean, we would bring Quincy Jones in for the evening to entertain us. And, you know, the, it wasn't about just technology. It's about what drives people. It was the cognitive diversity that we created among all the people. That's why John Perry was there and yeah. such. It's not that I, my politics were supporting John particularly, but you needed that diversity. And that diversity being cognitive was completely the most important thing we did. The second, and that's future proofing. You keep that going, you, you will have a team and a, and a group that bonds, okay? Because they feed off each other. Second thing was to create an environment of caring and support love flavored with respect and acknowledgement. If you don't care about these people, you can't, you can't put this program on. I, my relationships with every one of those people, Lynn, that you have there and today is one of great caring. I really cared for them. I wanted to be sure their careers weren't hurt but accelerated? How could we help support Alan's organ that he wanted to build? How could we do these things? It wasn't about trying to deliver the program. It was about respecting the people who were with us, who took care of everything then once you respected where they were. And that is part of the cognitive dissonance or the cognitive diversity that occurred. The, 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 and that will future proof, by the way, Trust me, you care about people in your place, somehow that's gotten lost in a lot of organizations because it's too transitional right now. But caring is a key. Uh, the third one was to create an environment of learning and supportive curmudgeonism, okay? Positive curmudgeonism was what we tried to create. We didn't want dissidents just making people angry all the time. The point was how to support that person who, and so we would counsel our attendees about just what Len said, speak up, but speak up in, in a way that raises the bar for the folks on the stage to, to, to engage you. Don't just ask questions, but raise their bar because then they enjoy coming to the meetings to get challenged. Otherwise, they're just doing another presentation. So that was another way of future proofing, which was to 
really be supportive in your curmudgeonism <laughs> as you do this. And finally, uh, understanding, and I think this was at the basis of Nicholas's book being digital, when Bob Lucky, Nick, Nicholas was up talking and Bob Lucky goes, hey, that's like being digital. Nicholas goes, hey, wait a minute. He goes and writes it down, and that's the book that comes out from Nicholas, being digital, okay? You're running two companies. You're all involved in two kinds of companies right now. You've got a companies that deliver what they traditionally deliver, and you've got a digital company. And the more I work in the cybersecurity space and et cetera, I understand that this is, this is permeates everything in the organization. It's not about IT. It's a digital, we're running digital companies that no one knows how to run. And so there's two jobs. You got your job and the job to carry forward the idea that the digital world continues to grow and expand. And there's, it's endless where you have those opportunities. So that would be my recipe for future-proofing an organization. Well, I think that Alan Kay, who unfortunately isn't here, said the future arrives unevenly. Uh, we see it, we see whispers of the future, and that's why he did his uh, concept cars at Apple where he would uh, m emulate a laptop with a cray. Mm -hmm. Because the future laptop had arrived as a cray, right. and I'm gonna put a <laughs> little keyboard on it, and then that'll be the laptop in five years. Right? And so what, what does that story tell us about future proofing? It, it says two things. First, you need people who don't like the present all that much. And this is the curmudgeons, it's the whatever you want to call them. Right. It's people who aren't satisfied. Those people in the meeting that keep whining and you want to shut them up. Um, uh, you know, you need people who don't like the, f the present. They want a better future. And the second thing is you have to give those people the opportunity to not only let the future come unevenly, but go to it before others. And how do you do that? Um, you're going to hear me talk later about the military matters. And when Lincoln wanted a general who was going to fight rather than McClellan, who just sat there in barracks, uh, Grant says to him, OK, I'll take the job, but I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. And we're going to lose a lot. But I have to move to engagement. In or I have to learn about the enemy slash the future in order to cope with it. And so you need people who are not only unhappy with the present, but who have the ability and the resources to do as Grant did and move to engagement. Because yeah. it's an interesting thing about the human brain. And you might have heard I'm a neuroscientist and I'm very interested in creativity. And having worked all those years at Disney, what I'll tell you about creativity and inventing the future, right. as Alan Kay used to like to say, People don't come up with Eureka ideas. They move to engagement, and they notice something off on their left that wouldn't have occurred to them unless they were in motion. They discover things, they stumble on things, and creativity is really a more about being action prone, moving into the future, noticing something that's funny, and then going off and doing that, because that's the real future. I think most of you out there have been in the technology business would look back at your career and say, the things you're proud of are things not that you set out to do, but things you discovered while you were setting out to do something else. And that's no accident, because that's the way the human brain actually encounters the future and creates it. So I would just sum up and say, to future-proof, you've got to get people who are pains in the ass, <laughs> who don't like the status quo, and you've got to, those people also have the, have the ability and the temperament to be action oriented and to discover stuff that the brain would never be able to think about. And that's how you future proof. Can I regress just a second? Yes. This, this happened yesterday between Eric and I, exactly what he's talking about. I was explaining to Eric what we did with our cyber work. And Eric said, hey, sounds to me like it's, this is what the letters of marquee used to be. Well, what the hell's the letters of Marquis? I, he said, well, it was back in the Revolutionary War when, and I said, okay, I'm gonna go look this up. So I went back to the room, looked it up, found letters of Marquis was when there weren't enough people in the US Navy 
to be able to deal with the British Navy and everything else. And so they privatized citizens. And it was an act of Congress that had to take place with presidential signature to say, do that. And I went, holy shit, we should do this with cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And so I called my partner, who then called Congressman Quaylar's office yesterday. And funny enough, Monday, there was a, a, Dem a, a Republican in the Dallas area who just submitted a letters of marquee to Congress to have private citizens remove the oligarchs' yachts because the government can't do that. And so I said, can we build a rider on this that also includes cybersecurity with the Russians? And you know what? Congressman Quaylar's office is drafting an, an, an issue right now to submit into Congress either this week or next to add cybersecurity. Wow. That's a vanguard meeting. Okay, seriously, that. <laughs> yeah, and that happened over a beer. Yeah, that, 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 <laughs> that did not happen in a meeting. Yeah, I mean, what? Peter, I'm going to I'm going to give you an opportunity, but uh, please keep it short. <laughs> what, how do you how do you future? Well, we got three minutes left here. What's what's your advice for future proofing an organization or an individual? Well. I think you have to be bold, you have to be brave, you have to be able to take risks, and you have to be able to be confronted with failures. Um, certainly in the European culture, uh, failure is sort of a social disgrace. Uh, personally, I have no problem with it. Um, from the military, I learned one thing. If you're faced with an uncertain situation and you have three possible decisions, just pick one, take that route. If it doesn't work out, you can change quickly. If you do not make a decision, you die. So that applies in business. And so all the businesses that I've start, started have been extremely uh, bold. Um, and uh, there have been a lot of failures, that, but there have been several really big successes. Uh, one of those is Shazam Entertainment. Uh, the other one was um, e-bookers, which was, became the biggest travel agent in Europe. And all I did was either put money in and make suggestions and massage the direction. But it was a question of changing quickly, spotting the opportunities, mm -hmm. and just going for it. Yep. All right. Len, do you want to weigh in on this one? Sure, I'll be short, and I'll repeat what I said in the beginning of this meeting uh, yesterday. You have to release your mind. You have to open it up. Get rid of the constraints you have imposed on it yourself. Yep. Listen to things that are going around you and uh, accept new ideas. We've heard that over and over again. But I'd like to capsulize that by repeating something I've done on a few welcomes, which says is, often we listen to a meeting like this or talk to our colleagues, we understand, we want to understand, how the heck does this thing work? What is this person talking about? What makes it operate? But the second step is to ask, why does it work that way? What's the underlying mechanism? What's the underlying idea, the brilliant idea, the extended idea? How does it reach beyond the particular application we're hearing? And if you take that viewpoint, okay, open it up, accept things, and listen to what's going on around you. And that's what this meeting happens to be about. We bring in a variety of ideas. We're all coming from different backgrounds. I mean, these crazy people here? I mean. <laughs> They have wonderful things to tell us. Uh, accept it, don't reject it, and ask how does that apply to me and how can I extend it? How else can that idea be applied to a new environment? So open mind, accepting new ideas. Tony. Thanks. So um, we wanted to, to leave with, uh, by paying our respects to uh, some of our colleagues who we've lost in recent years. Uh, we've mentioned John Perry Barlow on numerous occasions. Um, who was, was like every, he, he was usually the person everybody wanted to, to, to sit next to at, at dinner or lunch just to soak up some of what he had. Uh, similarly, I think Mike Hawley, just uh, Eric and Mike, the, the two polymaths I've known in my life. Um, which one was the smartest? I have no idea, but um, 
Mike could wordsmith absolutely anything better than any poet I, or novelist I've ever, I've ever heard. Actually, John Perry, pretty close to him too. He was a poet by occupation, songwriter. Uh, Doug Leonard and Bob Lucky, both gentlemen taught me the most valuable lessons I've had in my professional life. Um, uh, I mentioned the one that, that Doug, uh, shortly after Doug passed uh, at one of our previous meetings, so I won't um, go back over that. And, and Bob was always, a, he was a constant coach. He could tell when I first joined that, you know, it was, it was difficult to me alongside these eminent scientists and technologists to kind of raise myself up to the level of them for the purpose of running the meeting. And he said, just take that role. You gotta, you gotta accept the role that you have at the meeting. You know, yeah, you're not, you, you didn't discover the internet, but uh, now you're running a meeting that's talking about that. You know, you can own that part and uh, your role is really important. So Bob had a way of, of lifting everybody up, I think. Yep. Um, and uh, if you ever get a chance to go back and read some of his, his IEEE articles, mm -hmm. um, he used to write the back page there. I'm sure Steve Cherry has many wonderful memories of working with Bob. Mm -hmm. So, um, and Doug, goodness, I wish, I wish he had been here for the AI bubble <laughs> um, so he could sort the, the truth from the um, hallucination. Yeah. Uh, so he could, he could, I mean, Doug was a positive curmudgeon in that, uh, beautiful totally. style that, that Rich mentioned. Yeah. Um, and, uh, he certainly asked a lot of combative questions from the back row, uh, over many years. Anyway, it was a privilege to, uh, have been involved over so many years. And for me too, um, so we always used to have a board meeting before each of these gatherings to talk about who we're going to invite to the next meeting. What's it going to be about? My goodness. Um, I, I wish every Vanguard member could have had <laughs> a, some time in each of, in, in right. one of those meetings at some point, because it was the most fascinating conversation. And you would, you would also see that brilliant though so many of these folks are, they weren't brilliant all the time. You know, they had all the same human failings that the rest of us do. And sometimes they would say the same I beg shit, your pardon. But, and, and somebody would call them out on it, thankfully. No. <laughs> um, but, you know, kind of put them in an ivory tower sometimes and really, uh, that's, that's a little misplaced. They're brilliant people, but still human beings. So, um, all right. Uh, we are out of time, but on behalf of everybody who's ever been to a Vanguard meeting, I want to thank you, Rich, and then you, Len, for continuing the tradition, and thank all of you. Um, thank our audiovisual guys uh, who've been with us for over a decade now. Um, it has been a, a really brilliant ride, and... Um, yeah, I, I don't know if somebody will write Well, a story to, Tony, with that, I just want to say, it's the first time I've been back since I left Vanguard 20 years ago, 20-some yeah. years ago, right? This is one of the greatest honors I've had uh, to be here. And it's very, very nice to, to do this. So yeah. I, speaking for the, the gang, so to speak. And I, I, am, yeah. I, I guess I'm sounding a little bit like it's the end, but of course, we, we hope that the tradition can continue in a different form. Uh, John and Jonna, uh, thank you for carrying the torch. Nancy, thank you likewise. And some of the board members have uh, agreed to continue their participation. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we will, we will certainly try to keep the spirit alive. Um, and, uh, and John, I actually have all the original materials from day one from Vanguard. I have thousands of videotapes, VHS tapes, of, of John Scully coming up here for the first time to introduce the concept of what Apple was going to do on television and how I, I have a, a, a library that's unbelievable. So you're absolutely welcome to reflect back on that. Uh, half my academic training was as a historian, so I'm, I'm like salivating at the, at the great, chance. Great. <laughs> 
All right. Um, so let's wrap up this session. Uh, it's a little unfair to our next speaker to ask them to, to <laughs> come up immediately. Um, so I'm going to suggest we just uh, take a, a two-minute break. Yeah. We'll make some adjustments in the schedule. Uh, but let's take a two-minute break and then come back. Great. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Hold on. Yeah. That's wonderful. Okay.